Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Christian Fellowship Church. Glad you're here with us this morning. A few announcements to talk about. First of all, this morning is Family Sunday Christian Fellowship. That means everyone above the age of nursery will be here in the sanctuary with us. Uh, we are not going to have communion today. We're going to wait and have that next week, so I'll just give you a heads up on that. And we'll have communion both at the sunrise service and here at the 10 o'clock service next week. Safety and security team have a meeting this Thursday, 7 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary if you're part of that team or would like to be part of the safety and security team. Uh, come on out for that at 7 o'clock. Uh, the Easter sunrise service next Sunday will start at 6.15. And uh, it's not at the beach, okay? It's on the... You'll go midway up on the walk part, and there's a parking area, and that's where it'll be. So don't go to the beach unless you want to walk a long ways. And that might not hurt you, but bring a flashlight. If you do, it'll be dark. Um, we are still going to have Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Are they still having the Bible studies? Yes? Yes. Bible studies are still on at 6, and then the service at 7. Hope to see you there. Uh, Miss Gooch asked that I announce that they're planning a Europe trip in the summer of 2024. So some of y'all in this room have been on this trip before, but uh, the best way to take a Europe trip is to go with a European, and that's Miss Gooch. And uh, it looks like they're going to Germany, in, uh, Italy, Austria, and Switzerland, and you can contact Miss Gooch. I don't see her here right now. I think she usually comes in a... Where's you, where are you at, Miss Erica? Stand up, Miss Erica. That's the lady you see if you want to go to Europe. In about 15 months. Yeah. Did I do good? Thank you. Very good. Um, after service today, the, the youth are going to be uh, having a meeting at the youth building. So, uh, Trevor, who needs to come to that? Everyone that's going to the promise, Trevor and Rebecca, after service at the youth building. All right, very good. Uh, to give your tithe and offering this morning, there's uh, boxes in the vestibule up on the wall. There's some up here on the stage. You can go to christianfellowship.org and give there, or you can text GIVE to 270-906-9658. Uh, just continue to be in prayer for uh, Brother Bill Smith. He passed away. At the end of the week, we had his service yesterday, and uh, Bill, I, I'm pretty sure Bill was the first person saved at Christian Fellowship Church in a tent in Draffenville, and that was Jan Saperci's dad owned that field, and he, uh, Brother Parrish and them, and maybe the Allisons or the Garlands, got permission to use that property to put up a tent to have some tent meetings. And uh, so th there's all kinds of connections. Brother Robert, it's good to see you. Yeah, give him a hand. <laughs> I find stories like that interesting, how God works things out. All right. Well, I don't see any other announcements. If y'all want to go ahead and stand up, we're going to pray together. God's good, amen. Amen. I... I, hard, I don't do this. I have special visitors here today with me. Si I think six people of my family, cousins and second cousins. I'm glad they're here. It blesses me that they're here with me. So, all right. Let's pray together. God, you're so good. We love you. We honor you. Father, I just thank you for the Lord Jesus, for his sacrifice, for his obedience to your call. God, I just pray that each one of us, Father God, would not only... Receive his sacrifice on the, on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, God. That we will be obedient to the word that you've given us, Father God, through the Bible, by the Holy Spirit, God. That we will uh, chase after the same obedience that Jesus did, Father. And right now, lift up uh, our nursery workers today, our worship team, our pastor. As they minister today, God, anoint them and empower them to glorify Jesus' name. And I just pray you be lifted up in this place today, Father. We lift up some folks in our church family that need a touch from you, Father. We lift up Bill Smith's family. God, just continue to minister peace and comfort to them. 
And God, I thank you for that. God, just be with them. Thank you for a testimony of a life well lived to glorify Jesus and Brother Bill. And God, we lift up some that are battling uh, sickness. Father God, continue to touch Jim Clendenin and Frieda Rowley, Father God, Keena Van Pelt, my Sister Patty, Father God, just help them through uh, treatments and just heal their bodies in Jesus' name. Continue to touch Mike Davo, Father God. God, we ask you for a miracle of healing in Kathy Muller. And uh, just raise her up in Jesus' name, God. We thank you for that. Brimley Dolworth, Brother Dale Meyer, God, continue to touch them. Give them good reports, strengthen their bodies in Jesus' name. For Karen Greer, Father God, and, and uh, Monica Tipton, Father God, Will Cunningham, help them to recover from their uh, surgeries. Continue to touch Marlon Greer, touch him, raise him up in Jesus' name. Uh, for Teresa Collins, Father God, touch and heal her body. And we thank you for that, Lord God. Right now, we lift our hands to you. God, we welcome you, Lord Jesus. Have your way in our hearts and our lives today. Be glorified in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. the King of Kings. is 
That's when death was arrested and my life began. Your grace and your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. And my chain was a ransom he faithfully bore. And he cares for my dead, and he called me his friend. That's when death was arrested, and my life began. Your grace. She's over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you forever. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Played on a criminal's cross, and darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand. Yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested in my life, yes, we're free. Yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested in my life, being, that's when death was arrested in my life, being, that's when death was arrested in my life, being. amen. In your grace, so free, washes over. Over me, you have made us new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. When death was arrested in my life,
forgiven with mercy and forgiveness you will heal our land cause you're Jesus the healer you're Jesus the healer yes you're Jesus the healer by your stripes we are healed to you are Jesus here in faith we grab the hem of your where the mercy will flow, Jesus is the Lord. You are, O oh, sickness, bondage, and disease. Oh, and it must bow its knee for Jesus is the.
God is good, isn't he? Hey, before you're seated, just stay standing for a second. We want to do something. Aaron, won't you come here for a second, man? This is going to be Aaron's last week with us. I want us to pray over him. We're sending him out again. Just take about a minute and a half, man, and just share what God's doing and what's next, and then we want to pray over you, bro. Yeah. Um, so uh, some of y'all know I'm with YWAM Kona, Hawaii. Um, and I, would, I entered into a 10-month school. It's nine months of training. Uh, we go through three uh, Bible courses. Um, and then we have one month of outreach. Um, and so I had to come back. I missed a whole quarter. I came back for uh, surgery um, on a hiatal hernia that I had. Um, healing took a lot longer than, ex- than expected. So I stayed here the whole quarter. Um, and then I'm heading back. I think it's uh, three, day- three days from now. So... Um, I'll be back, going back to do my last quarter, um, and it's apologetics, so I'm super excited about that. After that quarter, um, we'll actually um, go on a one-month outreach, and my team um, is going to the U.S., and I've actually been honored to be asked to co-lead that team. Um, so if you guys would, be, please be praying for me and my co-leaders uh, for wisdom, discernment, knowledge of the Lord. Um, we have a couple places we think we might um, go in the U.S., uh, but nothing completely locked down yet. Um, so just more, uh, yeah, we just need to be led by the Spirit to go to the places that He Amen. wants us to go and, and to speak to the people He wants us to speak to. Amen. Good, bro. Thank you. If you would, just stretch out your hand, and I want us to pray over Aaron. One of the greatest things that I get to do and we get to do as a church is support people that head to the field, man. That That's inbred in who we are at this church from what we do next door at Christian Fellowship School to WME around the globe to raising up missionaries from within. It's just part of our DNA, and I'm just proud to stand beside this man. He's a blessing to this church, and I just want us to bless him as he goes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity that you're giving Aaron, Lord, not only to go, but to lead, Lord, and to empower uh, other young people, Lord, uh, to go to the next nations, Lord, and to be set afire on you, by you, Lord, and to bear witness, God. And right now, we pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would be with him, give him wisdom, give them direction, give them discernment, Lord, and just, we're, we're looking forward to hearing the testimony of what you're going to do through this act of obedience, in Jesus' name, amen. Love you, pal. You can be seated. I was going to tell you to turn around and shake a hand, but forget it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Ronnie, are you back there? Come on up here, bro. He's going to share a brief exhortation with us this morning. I thought this was really good. Uh, I feel like the Lord's been dealing with me about sharing something. And You know, in the book of Acts, if you read the book of Acts, you'll find that the Spirit of God forbid Paul and his and his helpers to go into Asia Minor. But then later on, he goes to Asia. He goes to Asia Minor and goes into Ephesus. And I think the reason for that was probably because of the spiritual warfare that was was going on in Ephesus. In Corinthians, it says that the Apostle Paul says that we fought with beasts in Ephesus. So I believe part of the reason was because his workers needed to be prepared to go into that type of spiritual warfare. But if you'll, but of course he went and great miracles were done in Ephesus. And in fact, he ministered in Ephesus and the whole Asia Minor received the gospel through his ministry in Ephesus as it spread out. But uh, when you read the, Watchman Nee wrote a book called Sit, Walk, and Stand. And that can be taken as, a, as an outline of the book of Ephesus. And if I think it's very important that you look at these. I think this is the key to spiritual warfare, or part of the key to spiritual warfare. is And that, that book is Sit, Walk, and Stand. And the first part of Ephesus speaks of where we sit. And it, sit, it says that we sit in heavenly places Amen. in Christ Jesus. 
that that's our position is in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. So it's very important that we understand that we already have the victory, that we already sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The next word, and notice sit means you rest. When you're sitting, you're resting. So you're resting in your position in Christ Jesus. The next, the next word, and it goes on in Ephesus, the next word is walk. And we sit in heavenly places, but we walk. Is walking is an action. So we walk according to the Spirit of God and walk in the, in the will of God. So we walk, and the next one is stand. And the Scripture says in Ephesians, after you put it on the Lord Jesus Christ and after you've done all to stand, stand. And so this is the three things. I think this is three keys to our victory in spiritual warfare. Sit, arrest, we walk, and we, after we've done That's all good. to stand, we stand. And the battle belongs to the Amen. Lord. Amen. That's a good the word. The battle belongs to the Lord, but we stand and let the Lord do His work. That's such a good hand. word, bro. Thank you. And in that order, that's a good word. Thank you for exhorting us. That's so good. Welcome to Tater Day Weekend, Marshall County. Hey, I walked down the other day and got, well, I didn't walk. I'm going to be honest. I drove. And I thought, I'm craving a lemon shake up. And I went down, and I got a lemon shake-up, and the lady said, that'll be $7. If she hadn't already made it, whew, I can tell you that will be the last of Tater Day that I'm enjoying this year. I couldn't find anybody to co-sign for me. That's the problem. <laughs> Hope you have a safe weekend out there and have fun. Uh, I do want to encourage you. I know Scott mentioned this. Next week, guys, 615 at the Dam. It's one of our favorite services of the year here at Christian Fellowship. It's our sunrise service. How, how many people have attended the sunrise service? Guys, it is so, 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 so worth your time. One of my absolute favorite services of the year. Last year was our 10th year. We had over 110 people out at, at sunrise last year. There's always people from the community that join us, invite people, come out and join us, and then we'll be having our 10 o'clock service us next week as well. Well, I'm going to out myself. I have a new hobby, and I'm excited about it. Eating. Who said that? <laughs> That's not a new hobby, actually. It's not a new hobby. I've had that hobby for quite some time. Uh, no, uh, many of my friends are making fun of me because of this. Uh, they've robbed me of my man card, but I, I proudly announced this this morning. I am into bird watching. Thank you. I want to thank a couple of our members, Matt Lewis and Mike Muller, for inspiring me to get into this. Guys, when I go into something, I'm fully in. I have my binoculars in my car. I've got my National Geographic field guide. I've got my Merlin and my eBird apps. And I... If I can, without, you know, sounding ostentatious this morning, standing before you this morning is the 13th ranked birder in Marshall County. Yeah. Guys, they're starting to give out awards for 13th place now, by the way. I know it's impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much. The whole concept of birding is speaking about what you see. It's about bearing witness of what you see. You know, it's actually not a hard thing, although I don't know a very many species of birds. It doesn't take very long to kind of hear their calls and to become familiar with them and to see them and know. But there's also something that is called a rare bird. This is not one that's seen in its natural habitat. Well, one that you see that, oh, th this one is not quite as common. And you pin where you saw it, and birders see this, and they want to come see this to add it to their list. This past week, I pinned a bird that I saw while we were doing the Servathon project for Christian Fellowship. We were out at Buckhorn Bay, and uh, I saw this bird, a little blue heron. Now, we have great blue herons around here all the time, but there was a little blue heron, and I pinned it, and Mike Muller responded to me, and he said, I just got a rare bird alert from you. He said, that's really uncommon in these parts uh, this time of year. So everybody wants to see this. What's unusual captures your attention. I've never thought 
once since I started this, this is hard. I can't tell anyone what bird I saw. Actually, bearing witness is pretty easy when you think about it. I saw a tufted titmouse. I saw a tanager. I saw this. It's easy to report what you've seen, and you just fill out the checklist of what you've seen. Men, wipe the smirks off your face, okay? I'm not going back. I like birding, okay? And I'm proud of it. No. Can I be honest? This may be a little oversimplified here, but do you know that the entire movement of Christianity has been predicated upon Christians being so overwhelmed with the person of Jesus and They are so committed to obeying him that all they do is they become witnesses of what they've seen and what they've heard. It's not that hard to tell what you've seen. Actually, John chapter 3 puts it this way. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that which we know and we bear witness to what we have seen. I feel like oftentimes we try to conjure up something to say or I'm not good enough to say this. God doesn't need you to add to what you've seen him do and what you've heard about Jesus. He just needs you to tell. He needs us to open our mouths. We witness what we see. We tell what we've heard. We witness about the things that Jesus has done for us. And at the end of the day, everything in our faith points to the person of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 18, it says, I'm the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father also bears witness about me. Even God the Father bears witness about the person of Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you don't believe the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness about me. See, every work that Jesus did, it wasn't just about that work. It was about to bring witness and honor to the person of Jesus Christ. Out of the mouth of Jesus, he said, every work I've done is to bear witness about me. So the Father bears witness about Jesus. The works bear witness about Jesus. The Holy Spirit bears witness about Jesus. In John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus himself says, when the Helper comes... Whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. You know that at the very core of the work of the Holy Spirit, he does a lot of things. He's the comforter. He's the one that brings to remembrance the things that Jesus taught us. He's the empowerer. He, he's so much more. But at the very core of the work of the Holy Spirit, it's onefold to point to the person of Jesus Christ. It's the Father, it's the works, it's the Holy Spirit. They all bear witness about Jesus. Also, Jesus said his disciples would bear witness about him. In John chapter 15, verse 27, he says, you will bear witness about me because you have been with me from the beginning. Our job is to bear witness about Jesus. Our testimony. I love the story of the woman at the well, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. She has such a peculiar experience with Jesus, and Jesus reads her mail and gets to the heart of the issue that this woman has. And he tells her, hey, you've been married five times, and now you're sleeping with somebody that's not your spouse. And she's like, oh, you're a prophet. He says, well, we'll see. And then she gets real spiritual and says, on what mountain should we worship? Our father said, you should worship on this mountain. And Jesus gets to the point where he says, I'm telling you a day is coming where you will worship me in spirit and in truth. And this woman's life was changed. And in verse 29, you hear her words. She is bearing witness. She says, come see a man that told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? See, her job was to bear witness. It's the same story of the Gadarene demoniac in Mark chapter 5. Jesus sets him free, heals him, delivers him. And that's the story of the pigs, which is such a fascinating story in the Bible. Uh, I've talked about it a little bit here lately. But at the end of it, what was that about? In verse 18, it says, as he was getting into the boat, this being Jesus, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might come with him. But Jesus said to him, Go home 
and tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you and how much mercy he has had on you. And the Bible says he went away and began to proclaim at the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And he marveled. See, it's not hard once you've had an experience with Jesus to open your mouth and to tell someone, look what Jesus has done for me. And And it was an obvious story because the man couldn't even be bound. He was living amongst the graves, and Jesus delivered him, and he's in his right mind. And all he had to do was answer people's questions. Hey, what happened to you? Well, let me tell you about that. Jesus came, and he delivered me. The man born blind in John chapter 9. The Pharisees are questioning him, and they said, Who did this to you? He must be a sinner. And the man answers, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I used to be blind, but now I see. You know, one of the most famous hymns, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. He gets to that point, I was blind, but now I see. You know, if you've been spending the entirety of your life in blindness, and all of a sudden your eyes are open, you would want to tell someone about that, I would imagine. You see, the question This morning is, why don't we witness more? It doesn't matter who it was or what it was. Every single thing in life is to point to the person of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. The works are about Jesus. The Father's bearing witness about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's pointing to Jesus. The signs and wonders are pointing to Jesus. Deliverance is pointing to Jesus. Salvation is pointing to Jesus. Whatever he's done in your life, it's to bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus. Here we are beginning what we call Holy Week here on Palm Sunday. And I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 12. Because we're going to see something in this that's fascinating to me. You know, most of what we know about Palm Sunday, they take the palm branches, they say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But there's a story that goes along with that. And we're going to read about the first 19 verses this morning. And I want to tell the backdrop to the triumphal entry. Verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Everyone said Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This must be known before we proceed any further. So they gave a dinner for him there, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Can you imagine having dinner with a man that spent about four days dead? That's some wonderful table conversation, isn't it? Hey, what would you do this week? Ah, not much. What about you, Lazarus? (laughs) Let me tell you, my friends. It's been an unusual week. (laughs) That's what's going on, and they're having this conversation, I would imagine it didn't matter, you know, if you got meat a few cents off a pound, you know. At at this point, Lazarus is dominating the conversation, I would imagine. Lazarus' sister, Mary, therefore takes a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus, and she wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii? You know how much money that was, by the way? It's almost a year's salary. A denarius was one day's wage for a laborer. That's almost a year's salary worth of this ointment. She's got quite the ointment collection. Thank you for not thinking that was even remotely humorous. Uh, And given to the poor. He said this not because he cared about the poor, But because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. And Jesus said, leave her alone, that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you don't always have me. Now look at verse 9. This is very important. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came. Everybody wants to see Jesus but not only on account of him. They also wanted to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So it tells us specifically, I'm reading words straight from the Bible here, 
They did not just come to see Jesus. They came because a testimony had truly taken place. They wanted to see the man that had raised from the dead. So look at verse 10. The chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. So they wanted to kill Jesus. They hated him. But now all of a sudden, they wanted to kill Lazarus. Why? I mean, it it would seem that uh, death didn't really work for that guy. He's found a way around that. But they wanted to get rid of his witness. Why? Verse 11, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. How awesome is that? Lazarus experienced a miracle, and now it tells us specifically, a large crowd is gathering to see him, and everybody is starting to follow Jesus because of Lazarus' testimony of what God had done in his life. See, notice, nobody said, Lazarus is really something. He experienced a miracle, but his miracle pointed to Jesus. That's so important for us to get because that's what what God does in our life is supposed to do as well. So let's look at the triumphal entry. Here we are. The next day, the large crowd. What large crowd? The large crowd that had assembled not only to see Jesus, but to see Lazarus, that large crowd. They had come to the feast and heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And here's our classic passage. They took branches of palm trees, and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things. Big shocker. They didn't seem to understand very much throughout Jesus' ministry. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and was raised from the dead continued to what? Bear witness. The reason the crowd went out to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. And I'm going to read that last verse in just a second. But this is so important. The entire triumphal entry, according to John, is predicated upon a couple of things. Number one, Scripture being fulfilled about Jesus. Behold, your king is coming on a donkey's colt in that passage but it was also built upon the foundation of the miracle to Lazarus. And it tells us that three times. This is why the crowd was here. They came out to meet the one whom Jesus had raised from the dead. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that he had heard he had done this sign. And I want to stop there. Let me ask you this question. If there was a certified person this morning that raised someone from the dead yesterday, How many people would want me to sit down and let that person preach this morning? I can tell you, it doesn't matter what you want. I'd be sitting down and say, hey, share with us what happened if you want. (laughs) Please tell us. That's exactly what's going on. And the Pharisees see it. They see that people are bearing witness about this miracle. In verse 19, they said to one another, we are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. That's a beautiful statement. We're going to get to that in a minute. There's a few points that I have from this story this morning. The first one is this, and it's simple. Jesus worked a certifiable miracle, and people saw it. Can we all be on the same page this morning? Jesus did something that was unmistakable. It it wasn't, well, like maybe he was partially dead. He, he was kind of half dead. That's, that's what it was. He wasn't really dead. He, he just took a four-day nap in a grave. That's what was going on. No, there was no mistaking it. He raised a man from the grave, and people saw it, and people told what they had seen, and that builds the scene. That's point one. There was a miracle, and people saw it. Number two is the crowd gathered, 
because of the miracle. Why are churches losing people in attendance? Oh, dear. I asked a question I don't know that I want to answer from the pulpit this morning. What's going on? If we're trying to spin plates trying to get people to come to our cool church, we're missing the point. We got to get back to the point of seeing the power of God manifested in people's lives. When that happens, you won't be able to keep them out of the church house. But instead, we've substituted the power of God for something far less. Hey, guys, we got the best worship in town. Hey, guys, we got an awesome kids' ministry. Those things are so important, but they are a sorry substitute for the manifested power of God. That's what we need in God's house today is a manifestation of his power in our lives. People come in, they leave in a different way than they came in. The broken get restored, the lost get saved, the bound and held captive get delivered, the sick get healed in Jesus' name. That's what I want to be a part of. Why are people leaving church? I'll let you answer that question yourself. Just don't leave this church. The crowd gathered because of that miracle. Jesus worked a certifiable miracle, and people saw it. The crowd gathered because of the miracle. Third point I want to tell him is this. Satan wants to kill your witness. <laughs> Ronnie kind of hit on this a little bit when he's talking about what they faced in Ephesus. I am convinced, guys, that so much of the things that we are facing is not about the thing that we're facing. It's not about that trial. There is something much more powerful at stake. It is your voice that Satan is after. It is your witness. It is your testimony that he is after. So much of what we're facing in the forms of trials and suffering, mental health, depression, discouragement, busyness, religion, It's nothing more than a distraction to destroy your witness about Jesus. Satan knows if he can throw this on us, then we will shut our mouths. I'm going to get down in it. It's going to get a little discouraged, and I'm going to live there a little bit. I'm just walking through it, brother. And then we start focusing on our trial, and we forget. Forget. Is that a word? We, we forget what it is that Jesus has done, and our voice starts glorifying our trial. Guys, I've been there. I have sung the woe is me song more than anybody in this church. My pity parties are better than yours. They are. I'm going to be honest, I'm really good at it. I'm so glad my wife's not in here right now. Thank you, Liam, for causing a distraction and her needing to leave because I would be getting amen and shouted down this morning. So many times I get discouraged. This morning I was sitting there thinking about some things and the Lord just brought me back to how good he's been to me. Jesus worked a miracle and people saw it. The crowd gathered because of the miracle. Satan wants to kill your witness. Why? My fourth point is this, and you need to hear this. Because you might not think so, but it's the truth. Your witness has the capacity to bring people to Jesus. I'm not talking about just Phil's testimony. I'm talking about my testimony. Not just my testimony, but Greg's testimony. Guys, God has been good to all of us. Can we say that this morning? It doesn't mean the road's been easy. As a matter of fact, there's been times it was a road I would rather personally not travel in my flesh. But at the end of that road, I'm telling you, the destination is the goodness of God. He has been good to me. He has been good to you. And Satan wants to destroy that. Why? Because God's goodness in my life has the capacity to influence others for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. It was to bring people to Jesus. People believed in Jesus because of Lazarus' miracle. It wasn't just about a dead man. It was about the raiser of the dead. It's not about your miracle. It's about the witness of Jesus. Jesus worked a certifiable miracle, and people saw it. The crowd gathered because of that miracle. Satan wanted to destroy it. 
Your witness has the capacity to bring people to Jesus. The last point that I have for you this morning is this. Your witness can absolutely shake the nations. It's not just about, well, I heard that. Yeah, God did a lot in Rick's life. A couple weeks ago in our Tuesday morning men's Bible study, guys, if you're a man, be at 8 o'clock at Parcells on Tuesday mornings. It's one of the greatest things I've ever been a part of. Men, I know this is a shocker, bearing our emotions to one another, sharing our burdens. I know that's a big shock to you wives because you think, I ask him all the time, what's he thinking? He says, nothing. Nothing has been replaced with us just being real with one another, and it's awesome. I love it. People prophesied over to one another right there in Parcells. You get the best cup of coffee in town, and then you go down to the dining room, and we experience the Lord every Tuesday morning. Be there, 8 o'clock Tuesday morning. I'm telling you, the nations were getting shaken because of Jesus. And the Pharisees saw it. It wasn't just like, yeah, that one guy believed. I was chasing a rabbit trail. What I, where I was getting at with that was a couple weeks ago, men just started sharing their testimonies of healing, of what God has done in their life. And it encouraged me. It shook me to the core. That's what's going on. And multiplicities of people are just starting to show up. And the Pharisees see it, and they say, look, the world has gone after him. Wow. Are you getting that? The world has gone after him. What does that mean? It means it was a movement. It wasn't just, yeah, we had, we had one salvation this morning. Praise God for that salvation. The Pharisees saw that this was something that couldn't be stopped. We're losing ground here. This is something we can't contain. This is a movement of God that is shaking Jerusalem, and we are about to lose our place. The world is going after this man. Can I share with you? That's my heart today. I want the world to go after Jesus again. I believe one of the biggest hindrances of revival is that the church has become silent. I'm not talking about the church not standing up on issues of the day. I'm talking about the church remaining silent on the witness of Jesus Christ. Those are two different things, my friends. Uh, (laughs) We hear it all the time. It's time to stand up. I'll tell you what it's time for. It's time for you to open your mouth and tell the world how good Jesus has been. It's time to restore the witness of Jesus Christ again. I've heard this. I see it on Facebook all the time. If you've posted it, forgive me. All it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Let me tell you what it takes for evil to triumph, for us to remain silent about the person of Jesus Christ. Getting a witness for Jesus will shake the nations to the core. We've got to open our mouth and refuse to be silent about who Jesus is. Jesus is wanting to shake the world again and the world will run to him in droves if we will just open our mouths and tell the world of the goodness of God. I agree. We must not be silent, but what's our message? What is the thing that we're supposed to do to combat evil? God help us. I feel the fire of the Holy Spirit this morning. Mm, It's our mission, and it should be our passion. You see, just like everyone else that we read about bearing witness, we must join in their chorus this morning and let our witness be heard. God the Father is bearing witness about Jesus. The works are bearing witness about Jesus. His people are bearing witness about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's bearing witness about Jesus. What about us? Well, I'd like to turn to the classic charismatic passage that all of us can quote. Many of you have it on your pajamas. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you shall receive... Oh, you're charismatic. And you shall receive... Power! When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, 
Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. How many people want the power? Six people. Praise God. <laughs> Revival is stirring. It's an abnormal service. Six people are getting hungry for the fire of the Holy Spirit. Just wait up. We like to stop right there. We want to focus on the power. Far too often, that's where we stop. Like, that's what it's about. It's not about the power. Uh-oh, heresy in the church of God this morning. It's not about the power. It's about the last half of that verse. You're going to have power come upon you, and what are you going to do? You're going to be my witnesses! We want the power, we want the power party. Just patent pending on that phrase right there. We want the power party. We don't want the responsibility of witnessing to Jesus. One amen. I'm talking to the right crowd this morning. If you want the fruits of revival without the responsibility of revival, why would God pour himself out on you? It's about the witness. It's not about the power. The power is real, and God will pour his power out on all nations. But he says when that happens, here's what it's about. It's about your witness. And you will bear witness. Starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, Richie, I don't really have a spiritual gifting of evangelism. My spiritual gifting is complaining and gossip. My spiritual gifting is to make rude posts on Facebook. My spiritual gifting is not to witness. Let me tell you something. It is not a spiritual gifting to tell how good Jesus is. That should be at the heartbeat of every person that names him as Savior. Guys, come on. The power will come and the witness will be released. And guess what? The power did come. In the next chapter, all oh, they were in one accord. Oh, and the room was shaken and a wind blows through the room and tongues of fire just sit upon each one. And it's awesome. But notice... This is so key. They didn't build tents in the upper room and say, ah, oh, I want to stay here. See, they tried to do that on the Mount of Transfiguration. When the glory of the Lord fell, Peter said, oh, let's build a tent. I'll build one for you, one for Moses, one for, we'll have a whole tent party up here, tent city on top of the mountain. And Jesus says, no, please no. No, 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 no. See, I feel like today what we do, we want to stay in the upper room when God has called us to go out and bear witness about him. See, the Holy Spirit fell, and all of a sudden Peter stands up, and they're like, these guys are drunk. We got a bunch of drunkards in here. Men of Israel, these men are not drunk as you suppose, as it's only the ninth hour, or the, the third hour. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. It's 5 o'clock somewhere, but it's 9 o'clock here. Let me tell you what's happening. And he preaches the sermon and 3,000 people get saved. Why? Because it wasn't about the power. It was about the witness. It was about Jesus. I want to tell you something. That has not changed. It is the exact same thing for us today. Guys, you're not called to create something fantastic. Don't build a beautiful net to catch fish. Focus on Jesus and let God take care of the rest. It's time for us to open our mouths again and begin to bear witness. See, that's not something new. That's something it's been about from the moment Jesus Christ stepped on this earth. It's been about him. The prophets prophesied about him. David talked about him and sang about him in the Psalms. 
And when he came, he was the fulfillment of those prophecies of everything in the Old Testament, guys, is pointing to Jesus Christ. Everything was pointing to Jesus. If it was the seed, if it was the sacrifice, if it was the prophecies, the Psalms, Jesus was the fulfillment of it all. And when he came on the earth, The Father started bearing witness about Jesus. The Holy Spirit came later and started bearing witness about Jesus. The signs and wonders came, and they started bearing witness about Jesus. The disciples went out into all the world and bore witness about Jesus, and now the lot has fallen to us, and we must bear witness about Jesus and join in that chorus that's been going for thousands of years now. It's about Jesus. It goes without saying, our role is not to promote our church. I don't care if you know the name of my church. I don't care if you know the name of our denomination. I don't care if you know the name of our Christian music or whatever else. All of these are tools to point to Jesus. They should never be the center of what we talk about. Hey, you got to come to this church and hear Brother Richie. Oh, you're going to be disappointed. But if we're inviting them to meet Jesus, he'll never disappoint you, my friend. Oh, he'll be there. (laughs) Something has gone wrong if something else other than Jesus has become our focus. Something has gone terribly wrong if something other than Jesus has become our message. That's the world we live in. But it is still about Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Who is Jesus? Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my deliverer. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Oh, let me tell you, Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Oh, he's the bread of life. Jesus is the Lord of lords. He's the king of all kings. Jesus was the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the redeemer. Jesus was the creator. He's the light of the world. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. Jesus is the rose of Sharon. He's the bright and morning star. Jesus is the son of the living God. He's the son of man. Jesus is the friend of sinners. If you're here this morning thinking, well, I'm not religious. I got a lot of junk in my life. Let me tell you, Jesus loves you. Jesus is the Holy One of Israel. He's the resurrection and the life. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, hallelujah. He's my rabbi. He's my teacher. He's my master. He's the lamb. Jesus is my advocate in the courtroom of heaven. He's the great intercessor. Even right now, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's living to make intercession for Richie and for you. Oh, Jesus is my great high priest. Jesus is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith. He's the good shepherd. Jesus is the lover of my soul. He's the cornerstone that everything is built upon. He's the counselor. He's the day spring. Jesus is the firstborn of the resurrected. Jesus is the Holy One of God. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the heir of all things. Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the just one, the Messiah, the mighty one. Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is the root of David. Jesus is the rock. He's the true vine. Jesus is my all in all. That's who I'm talking about this morning. Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus. Every need you have can be found in him. We need a revival of the Holy Spirit, but we need it coupled with a revival of witnessing about Jesus. It's time for the church to open its mouth, to stand up and tell the world about Jesus. 
It's time for us as his followers to shake the nations and make the world go after him. Who's with me? Praise the name of God. Has God been good to you? Has Jesus been good to you? I want to encourage you this week. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. Next week is Easter morning. There's people that will come to church on Easter that won't come any other time of the year. I want to challenge you with something. Every person in this room, invite somebody to church next week. One person. Make it a goal to tell one person about Jesus this week. Invite them. Make sure they're here. Tell them you'll come pick them up. If you can't afford the gas, I'll give you the gas money to go get them. I said it. Where are they going to sit? I don't care. I, I believe that there's people here that are members of this church. They can have my seat. I'll sit in the altar this morning. We will fit in every corner of this building because next week I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to bear witness about Jesus. We're going to talk about him, and our witness about Jesus will change the world. Who will take that challenge and say, I'll bring somebody with me next week? One person. I, I'm going to start all over. Open your Bibles. Well, that's hard. I'm not. See, that's when it comes down to it. Tell somebody about Jesus. Maybe they're your coworker. Maybe they're your neighbor. Maybe they're your spouse. Maybe they're your child. Get them here next week. Our witness about Jesus will change the world. And I want to tell you, and I believe this. Our activity and energy centered on anything else is totally worthless. Well, that's not entirely true. Yes, it is. Everything is about Jesus. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming. Lord, I feel so free this morning. Lord, you're the restorer of my soul. Lord, you've been good to me, Lord, so much more than I ever deserved. Lord, you're not a fictitious character in a book. You are alive. You're not, we don't serve a dead Savior. You are alive. Even now, Jesus is alive. Lord, I believe there's needs in this room right now that only you can meet. And right now, Lord, have your way in this place. Jesus, we focus on you. We lift up Jesus. We lift up Jesus. I don't care if anybody knows my name or remembers a word I said as long as they remember Jesus. I don't care if anybody knows what church this is or forgets the address of it as long as they remember Jesus. Man, there's bondages in this place this morning that only Jesus can break. There are people that are lost, and you don't even know you're lost until you came into this room. Jesus loves you so much he gave his life for you. He's your Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible says no man can get to the Father except through him. It's not one choice of many out of many religions. Jesus is the way, and he will save you this morning if you'll give it to him. It's about Jesus. There's some that are desperately needing a healing in their body. I want to tell you, Jesus is the answer. He's your healer this morning. He paid a price for your healing. Man, there's discouraged, depressed, bound up this morning. Guess what? Jesus is your peace. And he paid for your peace this morning, and he wants you to have it. Man, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can we stand up for a moment? I'm about to dismiss you. Don't worry. But just close your eyes this morning. I'm going to ask you to do something. Would you just lift your hands? And just in a personal time, 
before we have an altar call, I just want us to love on the person of Jesus Christ for a minute. I know you've walked through some things, but can you tell God how good he's been? Can we just love on Jesus for a moment this morning? Oh, Jesus, you're good. Go ahead, Aaron. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Love you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. From our heart to your heart. Jesus, we all would be here. But I just want you to repeat these words after me. That there's no magic in these words. It's just a yielding of ourselves to the Lord. Say, Jesus, you are all that I need. I yield myself to you. I need your salvation. I need your deliverance. I need your peace. I need your healing. And this morning, I recognize you as the source of everything in my life. And I give my life to you fully. No matter what I'm walking through, I submit my circumstance to you. And I crown you the Lord of my life. Open my mouth and give me a boldness to witness about you because you've been good to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I love you all. You can be dismissed this morning as you are. Meet somebody you haven't met before. Spend some time fellowshipping with one another. We'll see you next week. Bring somebody with you. We'll make room for them.